Well, even if you haven't got a chance to copy all that down yet, it'll be okay because I don't have much writing to put on this. And I, I got a lot of talking to do. And by the time I'm over, you might be unimpressed. Or by the time I'm done, you might be unimpressed. You'll be like, oh, I already knew all that. I just want to talk about types of numbers for a minute. There are many types of numbers out there. And to give you an example to, to frame all this, my son is, is right into numbers. As you can imagine, he comes from, you know, like we're all sort of nerd type people in my family. So that, that he's sort of into numbers. And he really gets zero as well. Uh, they've changed up Sesame Street and these type of shows. They talk about zero now. And so zero is not a big deal to him. He understands what zero is. But just imagine a conversation I have with a four-year-old. And I say, hey, why don't you tell me some of the numbers you know? And he goes, zero, one, two, three, four, five. And he can count pretty high. So I, when he's done counting, I say, okay, well, can you tell me a number between four and six? And he'd think about it for a second. And he'd say, and he'd count in his head. He'd go, one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, five is between four and six. I'd go, Great job. Five's between four and six. He understands the order of these things. And then I'd say, Bennett, tell me a number between four and five. Big moment. He'd look at me like I was stupid. Yeah, he would. He'd look at me and he'd go, uh, <laughs> there's, there, let me explain this to you, Daddy. Four, five. That's how that works. And if you were sitting there watching, I'd look at you and go, Interesting, right? Interesting, he thinks I'm stupid. And I am. I'm the one that's wrong there. Because the natural number system that he has learned, the numbers that he talks in, don't have numbers between four and five. They go one, two, three, four, five, six. I know you know all about the other numbers. I get it. But when you're talking about natural numbers, we call them, they're called the counting numbers. We don't have numbers in between. Go, there's always numbers in between. I'm like, no, no, there's not. There's not always numbers in between. Let's just say I looked out the window. I don't want to go over to the stereo and get feedback here, but I looked out the window and counted the cars in the parking lot. And let's say I said, oh, there's 32 cars in the parking lot. It's very interesting. And then a little while later, I count again, and there's 33 cars in the parking lot. Can there be, be between those two numbers? Can there be between 32 and 33? No. Oh, okay, there's always somebody, the actual person who goes, yeah, if a car was halfway out of the driveway be 32 and a half, or I could go out there and take a big metal saw and cut a car in half, 32 and a half cars. Okay, that's all fine. I, I, I get all that. But really, that's not how we count cars, right? Can, can we agree on that, that normally cars, you have 32 cars or you have 33 cars. That's the natural number system. We don't have things in between these other numbers. Okay, so that's a system we can work in sometimes and say, we're just talking about natural number system. Oranges are like this. For counting oranges, usually you have seven oranges or eight oranges. You go, oh no, my soccer team has quarter oranges. Okay, you're right, you have quarter oranges. And so you've left the natural number system and gone other, on to other things. Another number system we can use is called the whole number system. These uh, single letters are so handy. Natural system, N, whole numbers, W. And the only way the whole number system changes is it adds a zero in there and actually Sesame Street and those type of shows has helped us out over these few years, and zero is not such a difficult concept for kids anymore. They're like, yeah, I know what zero is. But actually, the natural number system, when we start at one, is, is built for counting things, not nothing. Whole numbers has zero, not a big deal there. If you're unimpressed by that, I totally get it. Integers. I. Well, okay, actually, way ahead in time, they'll actually start calling integers Z. You don't need to worry about that right now. I just want to mention that, that you don't always have to use the letters they're saying. But for integers I, and the only difference with I is, we've, been, we've discussed this a little bit. I don't know where to start, but then you get the negatives in there. In that number system, again, when you're dealing with integers, again, no fractions or decimals or anything like that. Just the integers, positives and negatives. And now, uh, now I'll go to this diagram. Do you see how the natural numbers are inside the whole numbers? We add on some numbers and we get whole numbers. Well, we add on one number, zero. And then we add on some numbers and we got integers. And then we're gonna add on some numbers and get rational numbers, okay? So natural numbers was N, whole numbers is W, integers is I, so of course rational numbers would be Q. 
And when you first see that, you're like, hey, yo, math people, what, what are you doing? Why, why would you make rational numbers Q? Well, R is taken by something else that we'll get to in a little bit. But actually, there's a reason for this. It's when we say a rational number, we use Q for quotient. And it'll become clear in a second why in rational numbers we want to talk about quotients. If you're thinking about fractions, you're right. That's what we're talking about is fractions here. When we go to rational numbers, we go to fractions. And if you're worried about the circle diagram, don't worry, I'll explain in, in a minute why we've got just gone to more numbers. All the old numbers are in here. These ones are all fractions if you want them to be. Yes? So we add rational numbers. Strange definition here. Pressure's on me to use just the right words so that you're clear on what a rational number really is. Any number that can be written as A over B. And I'm going to do a little more with that definition on the next page. If you sort of, if you, when you first see, you're like, okay, so you mean a fraction then, do you? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's what we're talking about here. Any number that can be written as a fraction, we'll call that a rational number. It begs a bunch of questions. Aren't all numbers rational? And we'll get to that in a second. Um, okay, so sometimes I don't even write this next part. We don't need this next part in grade 9 all that much, but I will mention it to you, especially in AP class. It's, it's good to see this and know that whenever you see this definition, you'll usually see B can't equal 0. Denominators can't be 0. Denominators can't be 0. I, I'm going to keep repeating it. Denominators can't be 0. Not like, well, denominators can be zero. We just need a smart person like an Einstein to come along or Stephen Hawking to come along and figure out how to make denominators zero. No, you can't, you can't divide by zero. You're like, no, we, we did divide by zero. I remember. No, you didn't. Remember you did flashcards or did you have Mad Minute in class? Do they still do that kind of thing? Where they put a sheet in front of you and you got to do all the things? Or maybe your parents had a set of flashcards to help you remember your math facts. There's no divided by zero in any of those things. It's avoided. Because you can't divide things into zero pieces. You're skeptical. Imagine taking $20 and dividing it <coughs> into two piles. $10 per pile. Imagine taking $20 and dividing it into five piles. $4 per pile. Imagine $20 and divide it into 100 piles. You could do it. 100 piles. But can you divide it into zero piles? Take $20 and put it into zero piles? Division was not meant to divide by zero. <clears throat> and if you're still not sure, take your calculator out and just type in 5 divided by 0 and watch what happens. Your calculator knows that this is a big problem. 5 divided by 0 and press equals and watch what your calculator does. What does, this, what does yours say? S some say math error, some say just E, some say some freak right out. There's some that do something really weird. They just represent something weird. We're not really talking about that in grade 9 too much. Well, I am because it's an AP class and it's fun to talk about these things. But just be aware, dividing by 0 is out. When we made division, the operation division, we meant divide by something, not divide by nothing. That doesn't make any sense at all, okay? <clears throat> I hope I gave you enough time to get that all copied down. Do you have any questions about this slide? Maybe you have a zillion questions. I've opened up a whole can of worms here and I'm going to try and <clears throat> clear up some of the stuff here in a minute. So what is a rational number? Basically, a fraction. I know I've got the fancy definition on the previous page, but I just want to make that clear. Basically, when we talk about rational numbers, we're talking about fractions. And I got news for you. This chapter that we're doing is called rational numbers. I waited all this time to define it. I wanted you to have some experience with fractions first before we said, okay, we're talking about rational numbers. Some examples of rational numbers. Okay, big moment here. This list is going to be really interesting as it goes along. I'll start with some not interesting fractions, some non interesting rational numbers. Three quarters. Yeah? Rational number. It can be uh, some kind of fraction. How about Nine halves. Improper, totally allowed to be a rational number. 
Negatives? Sure. Negative two fifths. Some more interesting rational numbers now, though. Five. Let's go back to the definition of rational numbers. I said any number that could be expressed as an A over B, a fraction. How could five be expressed as A over B, and it still gets to be, it gets to be a whole number, it gets to be an integer, but it also gets to be a fraction? You can just always put it over one. So I'm going to just sort of switch colors there a little bit to show that off there. So that's a little more interesting rational number. It counts as a rational number. Here, this counts as a rational number. Zero is in. Zero can be expressed as zero over one. And then all your old friends, which lots of times in grade nine people wish we could use more of these instead of fractions, 2.4 can be expressed as a fraction. Three point, negative 3.72 can be expressed as a fraction. And even crazy things like 2.6 repeated. Did your teacher use a little line over the six for repeated? Or a dot? Or you could go six, 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 six and just put dots after it? You got all those choices. They're all legitimate, so you've seen those things. So all of these count as rational numbers. And by the time that list is over, you might be like, well then isn't everything rational? No, there are some, there are lots of numbers. Lots of numbers that aren't, that there's no way to write them as a fraction. I'll just give you a couple examples. There's, there's one multiple choice question that test that says, uh, are all numbers rational? I just want to give you enough examples to go, no, no, not every single number is a rational number. This guy, pi, there's no fraction that exactly equals pi. You're like, well, how do they know? Oh, the proof is crazy. Crazy. It's like first year university type stuff to prove that pi can't be expressed as a fraction. Pi's fun, actually. Let's get distracted by pi for just two minutes. Let's say I had a roll of toilet paper that I could roll all the way out to Pluto. Now, just so you know, Pluto's a long way out there. If you're like, oh, I get it, it's a long way out there. There's no way to get it how far Pluto is out there. Pluto is like, like there's a lot of space in outer space. Like it just gone, Pluto's out there. So I've, wrote, I've put toilet paper out far enough to Pluto that if you wrote numbers for the rest of your life, you wouldn't get there. Yeah, that's how, about how far Pluto is. You can write numbers all you want on this piece of roll of toilet paper and you're never getting out to Pluto. You're like, yeah, you could. I, they send spaceships out there. No, they send fast spaceships out there and it takes years for these fast spaceships to get out there. No, you're not, you're not going to Pluto, okay? So we write out numbers and here's what pi does. It's so much fun. 3.14159265, you know, and it goes along. And then if you go out far enough around Venus, or something like that, all of a sudden it'll go two, 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 and you're like, oh, here we go. It's finally settled in. And Pi goes, no, no, two, 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 one, six, four, three, two, four. It just goes all over the place, and it does that forever. And when a number does that, it's irrational. It can't be expressed as a fraction if it never settles down and repeats. It has to repeat at some point to be um, a rational number. So that's the only thing I'm gonna add under here is Pi won't repeat. It'll act like it will. If you go out far enough, all of a sudden you'll be like, you know, you take your spaceship out to Jupiter. You follow the pi numbers all the way out and you go out to Jupiter and it goes one, two, five, one, two, five. And you're like, here we go. Mr. Tau is wrong. It's starting to repeat. And the pi goes, no, nah. one, two, five, one, two, five, three, seven, four, one, one, two, five. So, you know, it just, the numbers just go all over the place. It's just totally random. It seems. It's not random, but it seems that way. I'll give you one more that won't repeat and isn't a rational number. Just so you have another example, something simple like square root of two. Won't repeat. So won't be a fraction. You can estimate these things with fractions. Like if you put 22 over seven in your calculator, it's pretty close to pi. You can get ones that are pretty close, but you never get something that's perfect. We're not doing too much with this just chapter. Like I say, one time, I'm totally telling you the question of the test. One time I said, true or false? All numbers are rational. False. There are some that are irrational. They can't be made into fractions. And prove it. It's proof. You know. Any questions about that? More time here? 
Only six slides today. And some of them are fast slides, so get ready. Oh, this is one of the fast slides. Here's what I'd like you to do. You don't have to write all these numbers down. Not yet. All I want you to write is gr group one, group two, group three, group four. Make a little box, four little boxes on your, on your page. And then in each group, put these numbers into groups, but everything in each group must be equal, must be the same value. That is, it would give the same decimal, and it would be the same p positive or negative. It would be the same sign. So I'll, I'll get you started. In group one, you could put three quarters. Your job in group one is to find other things that are exactly worth three over four, positive three over four. So you look through. And I, I claim that it's four groups, four different things in the pile there. So take a couple of minutes and try that out. And I'll do attendance really fast. Oh, no, I won't. It'll record that if I do that. Oh, I'll just wait. I'll give you some time. What happened last time? I gave you too much time, didn't I? You were done so fast and I didn't realize it. Don't get distracted, Mr. Todd. Do you have questions about what needs to be accomplished? Four groups, everything in the one group has to be equal. Recording. Question. Are they hard to read there? Let me just... Uh, Oh yeah, no, one negative. Every time there's a negative, you get one negative. And if you're like, well, does it go on the top? Does it go on the bottom? Is it out front? I'm gonna talk about that before the lesson's over too. If you haven't seen that negative out there, I'm gonna talk about where do we put the negative when we got a negative? But each one of those fractions, that has one negative, this has one negative, this has two, this one has one, this has two negatives, that one has one, that one has one, and that one has one. Maybe that's enough to get you rolling if you're having trouble getting going here. I guarantee you, even if you're confused, by the time we take it up, you're going to be like, oh, I see what you mean now. More time? Who wants more time? You either got it or you're, or you're confused about what I'm asking. Okay. Here's what I meant. Four-thirds. Can it go in group one? Is four-thirds equal to three-quarters? No, there's no way that can happen. If you've got a different numerator and denominator, unless it reduces, it's, it's got to be something different. How about negative three-quarters? Can it go in here? Will it have the same value as positive three-quarters? Okay, so I wasn't very clear on that. I needed to make that a little clearer. I wanted anything in this group to be the same, not just decimal, but the same positive or negative part as well. So here... I need a new group because that's negative now. This one's positive. If you put 3 divided by 4 in your calculator, you'll get a positive answer. You put negative 3 divided by 4 in your calculator, you'll get a negative answer. Now maybe you, it's clear what I was getting at. So negative 4 thirds. Well, they clearly can't go in that box. It's 4 thirds, not 3 quarters. It is negative, like this one, but it's 4 over 3, not 3 over 4. Is it the same as this one? Almost, and so, some of you nodded when we did that before. It's almost the same, but it's negative, not positive. Now I've got my four groups. Apparently, all the rest of these are going to go in one of these boxes. Now that you're with me and I've explained myself better, negative four over negative three. Well, it clearly can't go in group one or three. Yeah? Four over three is never coming out to three or four. So which one of these is negative four divided by negative three equal to? Group two. Because negative divided by negative is positive. 
big moment in this part of the lesson. If you've got negative over negative, that's positive, and wouldn't it be easier to write it this way? So if you run into a fraction like this, negative 4 over negative 3, just immediately write it as positive, because that's easier to write than a negative over a negative. That's sort of what I'm getting to here. How about negative 4 over 3? Well, it's not one of those. So is it positive or is it negative? Negative. And now we're getting to you know, what, what the question that came up was, how do I deal with this negative? And the, the answer is, if it's out front, you could put it up top. If that's, okay, those two things are equal. So if you've got a, a, a negative out front and that's confusing or not helpful, you could put it up top if you, if you want in the numerator. How about negative 3 over negative 4? Well, it's not a 4 thirds one. Is it positive or is it negative? Positive, so it goes with this one. And again, the lesson is, if you've got negative over negative, why not just write it as a positive? And that's exactly where I'm heading with all this. This one, is it negative or positive? Negative. This one, is it negative or positive? This one might be a little tougher. What, what will you get if you divide 3 by negative 4? Will you get positive or will you get negative? Negative. And then this one, 4 over negative 3, that's also negative. And the big thing I want to do, even if you didn't follow my instructions because they weren't very well given, or if you're only sort of clear what I'm trying to accomplish here, I want to choose a representative out of, these four out of each group to say, given our choice, if we're given a choice, we'll write them like this. That is, if you see negative 3 over negative 4, write it as 3 over 4. Yeah, just change that uh, in the next line because it's going to be easier to work with. The less negatives, the better. Same here. 4 thirds, negative 4 over negative 3. If you get given this, write that. Much easier. This one's not as clear. Group 3 is not as clear. You're going to have to trust Mr. Todd for now until the next lesson. In the next lesson, I, I make it clear why we want to do this. This is the best choice of these ones, usually. Usually, the numerator is the best place to put that single negative. So, if you've got one negative in a fraction, you can put it up front. You can put it in the denominator, or you can put it in the numerator. And it's just Mr. Todd giving you some advice, saying, you're gonna, probably going to find the numerator is the place to put that thing. Same here. Okay, so after all that mess on that slide, the big thing I want to tell you is, if you've got two negatives, cancel them out. If you've got one negative, put it up in the numerator. You'll learn more about that either this afternoon or tomorrow morning. I've got to remember that. After here, I'm going to carefully write the Friday plan here so you can see it, and then we'll talk later about whether to do that other lesson or not at 2 o'clock. What time did I say? 2 o'clock? 1.35. Okay. Last couple of slides are a little quicker here. Place the following rational numbers in the correct position on the number line. Negative 1 and 5, 6. Where on the number line would you place negative 1 and 5, 6? First, let's establish between which two numbers this thing would go. Would it be go between 0 and 1? Would it be go between 0 and negative 1? Or would it go between negative 1 and negative 2? Which, which section would we put this thing in? It's definitely between negative 1 and negative 2. It's more negative than negative 1. It's like negative 1 and more negative than that. So is it closer to 2 or is it closer to 1? Yeah, it's almost two full negatives. It's only negative 1 and 5 6. How about negative 1 third? Between 0 and 1? No. Between 0 and negative 1? Yeah, okay. Closer to 0 or closer to negative 1? closer to zero. It's only a little bit negative, negative one and third. And so after all that, we come to a conclusion that you might, after all that, go, yeah, duh, I would have known that before you started. Or maybe it's a really big deal to understand that even though this is a bigger number, one and five sixths than one third, it's actually less than negative one third because bigger negative numbers are less than smaller negative numbers. That's just a little bit complicated. If you're like, I totally get that. Uh, if you just think about it for a second, it's weird the way we do that. 10 is greater than 5. We agree, 10 is greater than 5. But negative 10 is less than negative 5, so it, it turns the other way when we go negatives. That's not supposed to be extremely hard, by the way. If you're like, yep, gotcha. Great. Any questions on that? All you had to draw was a number line? And just make sure you understand that. Bigger negative numbers are less than smaller negative numbers in a weird sort of way.
Questions there? <clears throat> there goes my voice. More time? More time? Yeah, more time. Two more slides. And one of the slides is easy. I'm sure it is. My memory is screaming at me that the last part of this goes a lot faster. This lesson's like a pause in this chapter to go, let's just make sure we understand the big picture here. You know, and that's all that's really happening. Still more time? We're good? All right. Remember, you still got the iPad move. Write the following as mixed numbers. Okay, going from um, rational to mixed, sorry, from improper to mixed with negatives is no big deal. But I just want to warn you about one thing. As you start thinking this through, you can get yourself confused if you let the negative get into your thinking. Whenever you're dealing with negative fractions, keep them out front. Just go, okay, I want to do negative nine-fifths. I'll just put the negative out front and I'll stop worrying about it. Then it just works like regular fractions. Nine-fifths is one and four-fifths. Okay? So just that one little tip. When you're doing negative fractions, just think of the negative out front. Don't even let it enter you, the rest of your thinking because it can confuse you if you do. Like this one. I know this thing's negative, negative 32 thirds, so I just put the negative out front. And 32 thirds, let's see, how many times does 3 go into 32? Uh, uh, 10 times, so I've used up 30 of the pieces, so I've got two of the pieces left over. So you'll just have to trust me that the very best way to handle that negative is just to hold it out front when you're switching to mixed numbers. This one. Exactly one negative. I know the answer is going to come out negative, so I just put it out front. 16 sixths. Six goes into 16. Let's see, 6, 12, 18. Okay, 12. There's only two times. I've used up 12, so I have four left over. So that part of it is the exact same as it was before. Going from improper to mixed is the exact same. Just hold that negative out front. But, oh, I knew. Something else here? It happened to a couple people on the, on the quiz. Just forgot to reduce there at the end, so just make sure you're reducing at the end. This goes to negative two and two-thirds. Now, if you didn't copy down the wording of that question, please do copy down the wording of this question because your textbook loves this wording. And I want to talk about this wording so when you run into it, you're clear what it's asking. It says, write each of the following rational numbers as a quotient of two integers. What they're talking about there is improper form. It's a long sentence to basically say improper form. What they're saying is go back to one single fraction, no more mixed form. Now, if you've drifted off to sleep because you think this lesson is a waste of time, maybe most of it is, but this particular example is not. This is the one moment you really got to listen to. We have an algorithm to turn mixed numbers into improper numbers. And it says take the whole number part, multiply it by the denominator, and add the numerator. But you will mess up. You will get wrong answers if you include the negative in that thinking. Because there's two different ways to do this. You can go negative 5 times 3 is negative 15 plus 2 is negative 13. And that is wrong. You cannot use the negative in all this. The negative is separate. It's, it's a quality of the whole number. It's saying this whole thing is negative. So just leave it out front. Don't even let it enter your thinking when you're dealing with negative fractions. Then do your procedure that we talked about. Take the whole number, multiply it by the denominator, 15, and add the 2, so I get negative 17 thirds. Your calculator is there to check these answers. And if you're listening carefully, you're like, you're putting that negative out front. I thought you said you wanted it up in the numerator. Yeah, that's true. It, it absolutely is true. But you won't really need it up there and really want it up there until this last lesson of the day. First lesson of tomorrow. Okay, let's just see if I did a good job explaining that. Can someone tell me the answer to this one and then explain how they got the numbers and then I'll try and confuse them. I'll say something that hopefully messes them up. First, I'll tell them they're right, if they get it right. What will this come out to be? It's more a test of me than of you. Did I do a good job of explaining how to handle negative mixed fractions? Is there a brave soul out there who wants to tell me what this will become as an improper number? Go. Negative 59 over 7. 
negative 15 over 7. That's right. Now look carefully so you know moving forward that I'm never going to be out to embarrass you in this class. I told her it's right. So she knows it's right, and now I'm going to mess with it and see if she can explain her way out of it. I'm going to mess it up. Ready? Mistake coming. Negative 8 times 7 is negative 56. That's true. And when I add 3, I get negative 53. Look, I got her. And she's just for a second, she went, woo. Okay. I made the mistake. She's got the right answer. But she needs to explain what she did to avoid the mistake I made. I'm going to say it one more time so you can then explain what my mistake was. Negative 8 times 7 is negative 56. Then when I add 3, I get negative 53. What was, my, what was the bad move I made? Yeah, it, this negative really is just out front of the whole thing. It's more like this. Negative 8 is not a separate number. She said that beautifully. That's the best way I've heard that said in all the years I've taught is that this negative 8 isn't like a separate number. The negative is separate if you want. It's negative 8 and 3 sevenths. So when you've got a negative out front, leave it out there. 8 times 7 is 56 plus 3 is negative 59 sevenths. You've always got your calculator too. You can punch these both in the calculator and make sure that they're equal to each other to make sure. Any questions about that mess? That's what this lesson's mostly about. It's like just a couple little warnings. Watch out for this. Watch out for this weird situation. And the last page, the last slide is very straightforward. Here we go. One more time here. More time. No. Last slide, very straightforward. Uh, when you want to go rational numbers to decimals, in this course, we just punch them in the calculator. 19 divided by 8, if you punch that in your calculator, I think you get 2.375. Can someone check that for me and see if I'm getting old? Some of your calculators will leave it as a fraction when you type in 19 divided by 8. So you'll have to hit your change button or your SD button or your FD button, depending on your calculator. What's that? It's correct. Yeah. And then negative 5 over 3 is negative 1.6666666. And then your calculator says 7 at the end sometimes. And it's rounding. It's sixes all the way across. So there's lots of ways to do that. But oftentimes we just go 6, a little line over it to say, hey, it just keeps going 6s like this. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah, you'll want this down. And, well, I, actually, maybe the first one, if you're like, yeah, I know how to type them in my calculator and get them as decimals. Uh, yeah. And then this one, when you type in your calculator, you don't have to put the 3 in. Because you know it's negative 3 point something. Just type the 15 over 16 in. Uh, 9, 3, 7, 5. Someone got their calculator there? 15 over 16? To make sure I'm not losing it here. 9, 3, 7, 5? Calculator? Yeah. That part should be easy. Now, by the way, it's not that we can't do these. I'll show you over on the sideboard here. It is possible to do these questions and get decimals using skills you've already got. I hope you did this in elementary school, but we won't do it in this course. If you want 19 over 8 as a decimal, you just go 8 into 19, but you give yourself a bunch of zeros to work with because you're putting it into a decimal and you go, okay, 8 into 19 goes twice and I get 16. Subtract. Did you do a million of these long division deals? Maybe not with a decimal, but you did a million long division questions in, 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 in elementary. The only difference here is I got a decimal there as a guide. Then 8 into 30, 8 goes into 34 uh, times, no, 3 times, 24, 6, and bring down the 0, uh, 7, 56, 4, bring down the 0, ooh, 5, even, there we go, terminating decimal, it stops. I just move the decimal place up like that, okay? So I don't want you to think that this is impossible to do by hand. It's pretty straightforward. You just line the decimal up and do long division. But you won't have to in this course. It's a calculator question in this course when you want to go to decimals. These are a little harder, though. You need to know something about how to say these if you're going to be able to do these and go decimal to fraction. Way back when, in grade three, when you were first learning about decimals, 
you would have said this aloud. You would have said this is negative 7 and 5 tenths. Some people's brains triggered there. You need to remember that that's tenths when it's one decimal place. How about when it's two decimal place? Instead of tenths, it's hundredths. She's better at saying it than me. I have trouble saying hundredths. So this is 3 and 26 hundredths. What about when it's three decimal place? Thousand. He has the same trouble I have saying it. Thousand. And so you go negative 264 over 1,000. That's how you go from decimals back to fractions. You need to know how to say it. Now, if it's a repeating decimal, it's a lot more difficult. And there's a great question in your homework that teaches you how to do it. I didn't put any in the test, but it's a great question so you know how to take repeated decimals and do it. These all reduce, by the way. Uh, this is negative 7 and 1 half. This is 3 and 13 fiftieths. And this is negative, ooh, does it divide by 4? 4, 60, yeah, I think it does. Uh, six, uh, 66 over 250. Oh, it goes more. 33 over 125. Yeah. Some crazy reducing there. Your calculator reduces, by the way. Not that they don't like me to tell you that. You just punch this in your calculator as a fraction, using the fraction button, and it'll do it for you. I'm really not trying to get carried away on reducing big fractions in grade 9. That's not really what we're about. We got bigger fish to fry. Any questions about all that? I believe the homework in this, after all my explanation, is pretty straightforward and goes pretty fast. But... I will stick to what I said. We will go, no, if we're going to do that last lesson, we will do it at, what time's your break? 2 to 2.05? If we're going to do that last lesson, which is two examples, like I tell you, it's two examples, we'll do that lesson at 2.05. So you'll have from now all the way to your break to work through this stuff, and then I'll take a, it's not going to be a vote. But I'll just get a survey before I decide whether we're doing that last example or not. So you got your homework to work on. You got your letter to write to me. Oh, and, and, and after the break, I'll do that homework check-in as well. We good? We clear what the homework is for that section? Page 45 this time. If you're freaking out and you're like, I'm barely done the first set yet. Okay, just relax. The only thing you really, really need done for tomorrow is number two. Yeah? Because you want to be ready for that quiz. That would be not the greatest if you only had number two done for tomorrow. But if you're getting into panic mode, make sure you get one and two done. Take a breath, get one and two done, and then see where you're at after that. Okay? So, again, survey at 2 o'clock.